You found yourself where the present meets the past. The show made for the people, by the people. You're listening to The Monday American. What you're about to listen to is part one of a multiple episode series. It's attempting to analyze World War II in a way that you, as the listener, have never heard before. I think with a topic as uh, weighty and enormous as this, a prelude is necessary to help you know why I'm doing this and what makes this unique as opposed to the plethora of World War II information and programming available. So I'll start with my own fascination of World War II. I've always had, for as long as I can remember, an unavoidable, this unshakable fascination with anything concerning the Second World War. I'll never be able to stop studying or learning about it. Uh, whenever I can find anything I'll, I, I've ever stumbled on before, I eat it up. And this fascination I had it was the foundation for my interest in history overall, as well as, as my future of studying history in college and for life. I can easily attribute that mesmerizing effect it has on me to the creation of this very program. It's an event that I believe has shaped the course of humanity and the world unlike any other event in the history of mankind. And as I go through this show and this first episode, my goal is for you, the listener, to hear the stories of the men that fought and died, and the stories of the civilians involved, and to be able to hear their words in each story in a way that makes you look at the world you live in differently. I'm a firm believer that history is one of mankind's most valuable assets if we are to advance ourselves as time goes on. It provides us with the ability to look at what happened in the past and why then we can gain a further understanding of how to handle situations that arise in the future with the benefit of knowing why in the past. History is all about discovering the why, and I think that in that process it's important to never take the story out of history. Much like in a high school classroom these days that only focuses on broad facts and dates but never dives into a real story, we're not going to leave the story out of history. And what you're about to listen to is just that. It's a story about an event that happened about 80 years ago. The story is made up of many individual stories that all comprise and have an answer to the question of why it happened and how it got us where we are today. When I was initially planning this episode out, this whole series out, I really wanted to make sure I, I maintained a sense of uniqueness because there is a lot of World War II information programming available, and I wanted to make sure that this was not just more noise or just a repeat of something that was already out there and really would negate this entire project. So I started thinking about what would make it unique, and, and usually in the world of history, that's a thesis. A thesis is going to make something unique. Now, I don't necessarily want to dive into a thesis, but I do want to make sure I'm attacking this from a certain angle. During the course of this research period for this, for this series, uh, I, there's, I think I used 11 books. Um, they're all posted on the website, by the way, at the Monday com. There's a note, a, um, a section for show notes and, uh, citations if you're interested in further reading, but there's a book called Grunts, and that is written by John C. McManus, and it covers everything from World War II all the way up to Iraq. And in that book, his thesis is that the modern weapon, the modern weaponry of today, even dating back to World War II and World War I, all of that modern weaponry pales in comparison to 
the weapon of the common foot soldier. And the whole book uses battles to support his thesis on that. Now, I'm not really going into a thesis quite the same way, but I do want to point out from the get-go the way that I am attacking this whole subject is really what I think is the most important part of the entire war, if you can narrow it down to something so so finite, but it's looking at the war through the eyes of the soldiers who fought there. These men, they shed blood on this battlefield, they killed other men, and they came back, and the ones who came back, they didn't come back complete. So there's a really good quote from a World War II combat soldier, and it's in this this book, Grunts, by John C. McManus. It is, and I quote, There is no worse place than where the infantry is, or what it has to do. A war is not over until the infantry is done with it. Finished moving on foot more than the other, finished killing more than the other, and when it is all done, and the infantryman is taken home again, some of him will remain in that place forever. And I think that's that's the overall theme to this program is these men we're going to we're going to dive into their stories we're going to see what they saw based on their own words and i think it is so vitally important to never take what these men did for granted and to fully understand what they went through which is not even a, a thing that we're capable to of doing today but to understand as best we can the horrors that they went through is the highest level of respect I think we can give them. So all of that is to say that this is a multiple part series on World War II. This is the beginning, part one, the foundation for destruction. The date is September 1st. 1939. This is the day that Nazi Germany invades Poland. It is the mark of where the world was sent into its second world war in 20 years, and it would leave behind it an all too familiar trail of death and destruction. For nearly everyone alive, it was a, it was akin to watching their worst nightmare imaginable in front unfold in front of their very eyes. This was the one thing that they had been trying to avoid at all costs with every method conceivable for the last 20 years. This is the point at which several smaller conflicts were merged into what we know now as World War II. It was the day that the world geared up for another conflict they thought would be overshadowed in death and destruction by the Great World War, World War I which ended just so recently before this, it seemed like it was yesterday. The question that grappled the minds of everyone at the time was, how did we let this happen? This was the question they knew the answer to already and didn't want to accept it. Because by all accounts, World War I and the post-war actions were the blueprints for the most godless, bloody, and cruel event in human history. And those people went through the First World War, the beta version of World War II, if you will. They were about to watch it all happen all over again. Now, like anything involving history, context is is never too important. So the context of World War II is what happened before to make it start? What was the catalyst? The simple answer is World War I, but that's more involved. There's always a there's always a more involved answer to a question you can bring up in a historical sense. So before we go past and talk more about Hitler and the Nazis invading Poland, we have to back up. We have to understand why World War II happened in order to go on with this story. So briefly backing up into World War One. World War One ended in 1919, I believe, off the top of my head. I cannot believe I don't have this written down in front of me. But it ended with the most casualties the world had ever seen. It ended with uh, just years prior, 
a a level of technology that was already obsolete in warfare and a style of warfare that was no longer relevant. And it, it ended with the Treaty of Versailles, which was in Paris. Uh, I'm sorry, in France. And th- that that's where I'm going to briefly pick up for the cause of World War II. The Treaty of Versailles was a horrible treaty. It was a really horrible treaty. That treaty was essentially the ending of World War I, and the countries got together and decided someone's going to pay. Well, poor poor little Germany. They, they got the short end of the stick for sure in this treaty. Now, what follows is not a justification for their actions, but it is an explanation for why they chose those actions. France was incredibly concerned with ensuring that Germany would never be able to do anything like that again. In France, bore the brunt of the German assault. Uh, they never wanted to have trench warfare like that again. They even built a wall, a fortress, that spanned the border of France and Germany so that they could defend them from invading. And we will get there later because I think it is the dumbest thing in history I've ever seen. But the Treaty of Versailles, it essentially made Germany responsible for cleaning up Europe, paying for all the damages. And if that was not enough, they also had to strip their army and they were prevented or prohibited from ever re re-escalating or, or building arms again, just in case. And what that led to was a a little seed of hatred. This is where Hitler was a soldier in World War One, as well as Churchill and I believe Eisenhower. This is where he got his motivation and where the people of Germany also got their motivation to basically do some of the things that they did in World War II. And I'm not saying it's justified, but it, it does make sense. I think history is all about putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Everyone always says history is written by the winners. That's not entirely true. I think any any good student of history is taking the the losing perspective, if you will, or the opposite perspective and trying to gain an understanding of how they saw it and taking to account for the times that you are studying. So you can't just say Germany screwed up. They killed a lot of people. They caused a horrible war. They deserve this. You have to think of it from, from there end too, is they were fighting a bloody war, the likes of which the world has never seen. They weren't entirely at fault for World War One, and they were much, much more centrally to blame for World War Two. but you, you have to at least try to understand where they were coming from. They had some legi- legitimate reasonings to do what they did, but we'll get there. So the big thing to glean from World War I is the time period that it's in. It's at the beginning of the 19th or 20th century. That I mean, I think that the the movie theaters were just being invented during World War One. So this is this is a big, big boom in technology, and that comes with a big, big boom in warfare and weaponry, which the world gave uh, its people the ability to test it all out with World War One. I. I think one of the most important things to remember about World War One is that it started in 1915. And the French troops went into battle with the same uniforms and armaments that they went to fight Napoleon with. Nothing had changed in warfare for hundreds of years, really, at this time. I mean, the invention of, of the rifle and the musket, that, that was a big, big deal. And Navy, that Navy's always been there, but they were able to have better materials. But there were no real innovations in warfare other than the rifle and black powder for hundreds of years. This war saw more change in technology that something brand new in 1915 was a piece of scrap metal if it was a Navy boat in 1919. That is how fast the technology was going during this time. And the thing that most people don't remember, or obviously don't remember, don't take into consideration, is that 
all that all that technology was creating ways to kill people more efficiently and that saw a new type of warfare that the world had never seen before and i think that all too often people are gleaning over what that was like for the soldier on the ground in his book entitled The Face of Battle, John Keegan, another historian, talks about warfare in the age of edged weapons versus the current day uh, World War I and talking about the inhuman face of war. He says that a sort of empathy with one's adversary is the one thing that was no longer in warfare. And what he's getting at here is that World War I was the first time where where men were not squaring up on a battlefield in close proximity to each other with this kind of chivalric King Arthur's court knighthood type of, of war and in trying to stab each other with edged sharp bladed weapons. This was, this was something entirely different. The world had never even seen it before. And he goes on to say that, that one of the biggest differences is, a brazenness which would allow a man to look a stranger in the face and strike to fell him without provocation and compunction. That is what he argues is one of the biggest changes in the modern technology of war. And I couldn't disagree with him at all. He's absolutely right. No longer are two men squaring off and and having the the audacity and the boldness to go hand to hand man to man and to pierce him with a spear or a sword and to look him in the eyes and probably touch him push him onto the ground while you're doing it it wasn't like that anymore and they did not expect this in World War 1 at all they really did think it was going to be similar to all the other wars in the past and who could blame them it was a type of warfare they had never seen i mean the french army was wearing Napoleonic uniforms and I think one of the biggest the biggest concepts to gather about this change in technology and warfare is the the change in the weaponry it was it was it was cruel and it was dirty and it was it was mean Keegan says I'm yeah Keegan says in his books Weapons have never been kind to human flesh, but the directing principle behind their design has usually not been that of maximizing the pain and damage they can cause. Before the invention of explosives, the limits of muscle power in itself constrained their hurtfulness. So this shouldn't be too hard to understand. Until World War I, you had to, you manpower, the muscle of a man was required to use a weapon of war for the most part. You had to you had to manually operate it to kill someone. But this was entirely different. He continues to expound on that idea when he says the rise of thing killing as opposed to man killing weapons. Heavy artillery is an example, which by their side effects inflicted gross suffering and disfigurement. It invalidated all these restraints. And he's talking about the um, there was chemical gas um, and certain type of bullets. They were given international force by the Hague Convention of 1899, outlawing them. But basically, he was saying that after they saw these new weapons, those those didn't matter. It, those were no longer the worst weapons. Uh, he continues, as a result, restraints were cast to the wind. It is now a desired effect of many man-killing weapons that they inflict wounds as terrible and terrifying as possible. And this just goes to show why World War I was so massively catastrophic to the people that were in it, is because it, it embodied this divergence from civilian life and soldier life. Keegan touches on it in this book, The Face of Battle. I, I'd highly recommend it if you have any interest in reading any kind of military history. But he talks about how th in this war... It, it was the the marking point of where no longer was it a citizen and a soldier and m military and civilian life having having crossovers they were they were diverting from each other quickly and you start to see that with soldiers in World War one who uh, 
were coming back shell shock. That was the first real reported case of shell shock, I believe, it was in World War One. But the first widespread case of shell shock was absolutely in World War One, and the Allies used to assass they not assassinate they used to put the men who had shell shock, which we now know as PTSD. They used to execute them because they thought it was cowardice, and it's just, it goes it just serves to give you an idea of what time period this was what was going on and how these people thought and it's not their fault they didn't know any better but to think that motor cars mimic missiles and machine machine tools mimic machine guns like in this futuristic way the divergence between the facts of every day and of battlefield existence it ha- it it was not only greater than ever before, but it was widening each year. And you see that with the types of weapons they're building. These people are thinking up the the worst ways for someone to die, and then they're making that tool happen. It was a war that saw many, many changes, not just on the battlefield. Now, one of the reasons why World War II started is because the people coming out of World War I were so overly concerned with this quote-unquote, never-again mentality. They wanted to ensure that a war like that would never happen again, and understandably so. And one of the reasons why they had this mindset was because of how bad World War I was in comparison to every other war that the world had ever seen. Whereas used to, it used to be, before World War I, on a battlefield, a battle would last no more than one to two days, and that was a long battle. One of the most famous battles of World War I is the Battle of the Somme, which started on July 1st of 1916, and it went all the way to November of the same year. And if these people were used to a two- or three-day battle being a long one, and the Somme goes on for that long, you cannot blame them for for not being able to handle that, that amount of warfare all at once. It was a lot of changes. Remember, some of these people were born when the Civil War was going on or before it. A lot of things were changing in this war. One of the biggest changes was the introduction of automatic weapons to the battlefield and how that affected the trench warfare. So in World War One, you had a lot of stalemates, and that is part of the reason for the Somme lasting so long. You had artillery that was shelling the battlefield so much that the soldiers would nearly refuse to go out but you also had zeroed in pre-aimed machine gun nests and machine guns hadn't been used like this ever before and they didn't really know how to fight them it was a, a lot of this war was just people figuring out how things were going to be used in the future like airplanes they didn't think they had a place for them in the war and it turns out that they did but the battle of the Somme that was one of the worst battles in World War One, and one of the big reasons that a lot of the people just, they said they would do anything in order to prevent that from happening again, and I don't blame them one single bit. And a sergeant from the Irish Army has a great, great account of what it's like to be in that place and to charge into what you're pretty sure is just your death in fighting with these machine guns. And he says... I could see away to my left and my right, long lines of men. Then I heard the patter-patter of machine guns in the distance. By the time I'd gone another ten yards, there seemed to be only a few men left around me. By the time I had gone twenty yards, I seemed to be on my own. Then I was hit myself. Now, aside from just the actual horrors of being in that situation and and being just waiting in a trench knowing that you're going to have to climb a ladder out and you're going to have to charge. And if you're lucky enough to make it through, which 33% of all the soldiers were killed immediately from getting out of the trenches by machine gun fire, if you were one of those lucky people who made it, then you had to go and charge the lines against the Germans and meet them at the trenches very seriously outnumbered. This was a suicide mission, and no wonder so many people went crazy I can't imagine having to face that and to do that and to know that I'm going to jump out of there and probably immediately get hit by a couple bullets if I'm quote-unquote lucky. I don't even see how this is lucky. I might make it to the enemy line. Now, on top of that, it was a learning experience for the generals as well. It was a very, It's famous for being a very poorly run uh, 
battle. Um, they didn't know how to use the artillery that they had. They didn't understand what was really at stake here. They didn't. They didn't really know how to fight war yet in the 20th century, and this was a battle that was notoriously well or underplanned, but a a notoriously good learning curve for all those involved for the future of World War I. Not to mention, the Battle of the Somme alone took 1.5 million casualties from all sides combined. That's a number that's that's so outrageously big, it, it reminds me of the quote from Joseph Stalin, and this may very well be where he got it from in World War I, where a hundred deaths is a tragedy, a thousand deaths is a statistic. And I think I butchered it, it might actually be a million deaths is, is a statistic, but the point remains the same. You know, a small amount of deaths, that's that's always a tragedy, everyone's always very sad, but the the larger any death toll gets for anything, the more humans become less and less sympathetic because of the large number. They can't personalize that many deaths. They can't, they can't quantify that in their heads. It doesn't hurt them. It's not a tragedy. The Battle of the Somme was a tragedy, and 1.5 million people died and that was just one of the first battles of the whole war. And keep in mind, they were not used to this. Big armies used to have 30,000 people dying in the course of an entire campaign, or maybe even the whole size of the army. So to say 1.5 million people died, the people of, the, of Earth couldn't fathom that. They couldn't comprehend that. And that kind of gives you a good idea of why this was so shocking to them and why they justified what they did with it. And I I don't think anyone would really blame them if they went through that. And all that led to was the appeasement method, which is so famously known for a terrible way to handle that after World War One and, and escalate World War Two, but they all they wanted to do was avoid having another one battle that killed one point five million people. It it really is hard to blame them. So the Treaty of Versailles, it, it only added added to the pain by forcing Germany to uh, pretty much humiliate itself. It was it was a very prideful country. They always have been, but they had to de-escalate their armies. They weren't ever allowed to build them up again. They got they got the screws pushed to them pretty hard in this treaty. And the French were largely the ones who wanted that to happen in the treaty. And you're going to get a sense of this the more you listen to this episode and the upcoming ones that I I am just on a personal note, I'm no fan of the French, and I will tell you why, and I will not filter it out, but that's not on this on this stretch right here. But but the French they just won't they sought punishment for for Germany. Then they built the Maginot line, which is a, a very well constructed, very impressive defensive fortification. It spanned the line where France and Germany came together. And this is always the problem I've had with this. Be- beautifully well built, very, very impressive in size and the ability to house soldiers. It was like some of these soldiers could stay in there for a year without seeing the sun if they wanted to. But the the French built this on their border with Germany. And the problem is that's not how Germany invaded them the first time. And it wasn't how they invaded them the second time. So they wasted all that money they were supposed to hold out against Hitler for, I think, an estimate I saw was three to four years. They lasted barely three months. I don't even think they made it that long. So all that to say, it, it, the poor leadership did not end with the Battle of the Somme. It continued down into Charles de Gaulle and General Charles, Charles, I believe his first name, Montgomery, the British, the basically the British highest general, and Charles de Gaulle was the president of France who tucked tail and ran as soon as the Germans got in. So like I mentioned before, this is not an apology for the way that they they acted before World War II, the people in this era, and the way that they were, they were genuinely afraid. And you have to understand, when someone is genuinely afraid, they are not going to think rationally. And sure enough, Hitler got power of Germany and convinced the people to follow him. And history has shown us time and time again that that is one of the most dangerous things for 
ourselves as human beings is when someone can successfully convince others to follow him. And that is what Hitler was good at. And really, really good. And it brings us back to September 1st of 1939. All that should help you understand why the people chose it. The appeasement that you will always hear about, it will help you understand why Germany had motive to do what they did not justified motive but they use that in their own heads as a justification now while all this was going on what was america up to they were pretty much doing their own thing they hadn't really secured i guess you could say they secured but they hadn't fit into their role of superpower yet and i don't they didn't really become a superpower until after world war ii but certainly World War One, they saw a, a massive depression that they were able to get out of, and they, they were able to turn things around. They were, they were very isolationist. They, did, they wanted nothing to do with Europe. There's, you can find papers that, that just get mad, mad as hell for FDR for putting them back in there. And that brings us to how we got involved in this war to make it the big, big war that it was. Up until this point, we had not really had any issues, for the most part, with Nazi Germany. They were leaving us alone, and they were leaving them... I, I'm sorry, they were leaving us alone, and we were, for the most part, leaving them alone. And that also attributed to that appeasement. So there's there's so many different factors for why World War II could start. I, I mean, literally have a book that has ten reasons in it. Um, it it's just one of those things that... I don't find the why as important here because I find the personal testimony as the most important here. And that's where I think my fascination lies in World War II. These firsthand accounts like Eugene Sledge, uh, his book titled With the Old Breed, one of the most compelling retellings of military engagement in, in of all of them that have ever been written. Books like Bloodlands that take you into the world of people who were experiencing all of these horrible events. Not only do they take you into that world, they give you a one of a kind glimpse of that world through their own eyes. And it's not always a view that's easy to stomach either. So keep that in mind. As we continue, we are going to see world war two as those who were actually there. So now let's go over to the Eastern front pre uh, everything we've talked about so far. We have Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union. And what was going on in 1932 and 1933 was a famine. But this was a famine like the world has never even seen before. And really, the world has never seen a famine on this scale since then. And thank God for that. So this was Stalin. He was starving his own people in the Ukraine. And the Ukraine came about after World War I, sort of during World War I, but World War I and the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, it secured its independence with cities like Kiev, and I am sure I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, so pardon my butchering of what is going to be plenty of butcherings to come, the city of Lviv, L-V-I-V. Those were two of the cities that mainly represented the independence of the Ukraine. So in the in the native Russian, this famine in the Ukraine is known as Holodomor, and it had been pre-warned about, you know, based on climate conditions. People can make these sorts of predictions, but no one could have ever predicted the way that Stalin would use it to kill the population off in the Ukraine, or the way in which Stalin and his Communist Party were able to make it their tool of genocide. In the Soviet Union, authorities all but banned discussion of the famine. Ukrainian historian Stanislav Kolchitsky states the Soviet government ordered him to falsify his findings and depict the famine as an unavoidable natural disaster to absolve the Communist Party and uphold the legacy of Stalin. But let's call it what it is. It was a genocide. The official death toll of this starvation isn't exactly known to, due to poor record keeping in the Soviet bloc. But depending on which source you use, and there are many, deaths can span from 10 million people up to as many as 12 million people starved to death. Think about that for a minute. 12 million, even 10 million people. These are kinds of numbers that 
hardly can be grasped when they reach figures that are this high. That's nearly twice as many as the Holocaust, and this all happened in one year. It all spanned between 1932 and 1933. And ironically enough, it's this kind of death toll that reminds me of a quote from Stalin himself. One death is a tragedy, a million deaths a statistic. It's deaths like this that make that make it just impossible to grasp, and that, that one death is a tragedy. Everyone can imagine one person dying, or if, if they hear about one person dying, it's a tragedy. Everyone in the community is around them, and it involves everyone. But when you have a million people dead... That's so many people that it it just becomes a statistic that you read and you feel sad, but it, it doesn't hit you the same way emotionally. And it's it's that quote that applies perfectly to this. 12 million people at this point in history, we can't really put that into perspective. It's become a statistic to us. It's times like these where I turn to the words written by others that describe this event much more eloquently than I am able to do. In Timothy Snyder's book, The Bloodlands, which talks about Europe between Hitler and Stalin, it starts with saying, At the German and Soviet Soviet killing sites, the methods of murder were rather primitive. Of the 14 million civilians and prisoners of war killed in the Bloodlands between 1933 and 1945, more than half died because they were denied food. The two largest mass killing actions after the Holocaust... Stalin's directed famines of the early 1930s and Hitler's starvation of Soviet prisoners of war in the early 1940s. In Stalin's Great Terror of 1937-8, to nearly 700,000 Soviet citizens were shot. And it goes on to talk about how in the Holocaust, the Jews that were, were taken by the Germans were, were as likely to be shot as they were to be gassed. And then it even goes on to say that the gassings committed by Hitler those those were almost lenient compared to this this method of dying in the Soviet Union. In the 1940s, hydrogen cyanide was used as a pesticide. Carbon monoxide was produced by internal combustion engines. The Soviets and the Germans relied upon technologies that were hardly novel even in the 30s and 40s. These were the ways that they were gassed. And if it was carbon monoxide, sometimes you just fall asleep. He goes on to say, No matter which technology was used, the killing was personal. People who starved were observed, often from the watchtowers, by those who denied them food. People who were shot were seen through the sights of rifles at very close range, or held by two men while a third placed a pistol at the base of the skull. People who were asphyxiated were rounded up, put on trains, and then rushed into the gas chambers. They lost their possessions, and then their clothes, and then, if they were women, their hair. Each one of them died a different death since each one of them had lived a different life. Think about that for a minute. Of all those millions and millions of people, each one of them lived a different life. And even though they died in the same way, they died a different death. And that is a powerful, powerful quote from the book Bloodlands and Timothy Snyder. And he goes on, because oftentimes we as adults don't really sympathize with other adults or stories. Sometimes it takes unfortunately, as in this case, the story of children to really evoke the emotions out of someone and to really understand just how awful it was of what was going on. He notes just before going into a story that the average life expectancy of a boy born in 1933 was just seven years. He continues into a story, and I'll quote, School children at first wrote to the appropriate authorities in the hope that starvation was the result of a misunderstanding One class of elementary school students, for example, sent a letter to party authorities asking, For your help, since we are falling down from hunger, we should be learning, but we are too hungry to walk. The story continues. Soon this was no longer noteworthy. In eight-year-old Yuri Lysenko's school in the Kharkiv region, a girl simply collapsed in class one day, as if asleep. The adults rushed in, but Yuri knew that she was beyond hope that she had died and that they would bury her in the cemetery like they had buried people yesterday and the day before yesterday and every day. Boys from another school pulled out the severed head of a classmate while fishing in a pond. His whole family had died. Had they eaten him first, or had he survived the deaths of his parents only to be killed by a cannibal? No one knew, but such questions were commonplace for the children of Ukraine in 1933. 
It's stories like those that accurately portray the horrors of what was actually going on in these places at that time and what these people were actually seeing. Now, despite all this killing, Stalin did not exactly want to go back into another very escalated, drawn-out conflict, especially when he was starving his own people that could be potentially used as machine gun fodder. Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union surprised the world by signing the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, in which the two countries agreed to take no military action against each other for the next ten years. This was in 1939, after the bloodletting, but shortly before the invasion of Poland. It was this non-aggression pact that placed a very odd strain on the shoulders of the Allied forces. Their appeasement method that had been unchecked before, now after this non-aggression pact, meant that the Nazi expansion could go on to the borders of the Soviet Union and stop on the shores of England, whether that be the Thames or the Atlantic. The U.S. decided to help the British through the Lend-Lease Act, which was an act in which we would lend them ammunition, parts, airplanes, tanks, in, response, in return for money, money which they didn't have to pay right away. It was essentially a, a at-face-value act. It was just so we could give the British some help without actually being caught in an act of war. Seems to be a, a motif for American history. As far as our move for what we are going to do before actually getting officially involved in the war. But I digress. This act was passed, this Lend-Lease Act was passed on March, it was passed in March of 1941. Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, which we're about to get into, on December 11th of 1941, Hitler, and apparently without consulting nearly anyone, declares war on the United States. He cited a series of provocations as the reasoning which all really started with the Lend-Lease Act. Later that afternoon, the U.S. would declare war on Nazi Germany, setting in motion the machine of war that eventually leads us to the shores of France. But before we get to that point, let's take a quick break and let's go over to Asia. And this is what makes it so difficult to cover World War II is because it is such a massive, massive topic with so much going on that you have to jump between topic and topic. Right now, we have to go back over to Asia because without knowing what's going on over there, none of, none of the rest of the story really makes sense. So bear with me as I do jump back and forth, but it is important and I promise it will come all to, a, to an ending, a, a bloody, bloody horrible ending, but on to Asia we go, and we're going to back up in years a little bit, about 10 years just after World War I, and we're going to talk specifically for just a brief moment about the relations of Japan and China as it pertains to World War II. And do be warned that the Pacific theater of this war is the war that tends to be the nastiest and have the most harrowing of personal stories. So I'll keep this backstory brief for time's sake. Starting in about 1937, the Japanese and the Chinese were involved in a war already. This was the conflict that escalated and eventually evolved into the Pacific Theater of World War II. It starts in August of 1937 when Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek deployed his best army to fight about 300,000 Japanese troops in Shanghai. But after three months of fighting, Shanghai fell. The Japanese continued to push the Chinese forces back, capturing the capital of Nanking in December of 1937 and committing what would which would be known as the Nanking Massacre. And I will pause here because what is typically known as the Nanking Massacre is known to historians and in historian circles as the Rape of Nanking. On December 13, 1937, the Japanese struck at the nationalistic capital city Nanking, today is known as Nanjing. This became one of the most brutal exhibitions of sadistic horror in history. Between 250 and 300,000 residents of the city were murdered. Most of them were tortured before they were murdered. Women were raped repeatedly, and then their uteruses were ripped out. They were bound and gagged and left to die slowly as rats began to eat the guts that hung out of their bodies. It was reported in Tokyo papers that at least two Japanese officers actually had a contest to see who could lop off the most Chinese heads. Chinese soldiers were declared by consent of the emperor, not enemy combatants, but criminals. 
On December 18th, many of them were taken out to town to the banks of the Yangtze River, tied together, bayoneted, some were now dead, some were alive, and they were all pushed into the river to drown. 57,500 died in what is called the Straw String Gorge Incident. Screams of those still alive tied to the dead bodies echoed through the gorge, but not for very long. And I'll pause here to tell the story of what I think is the most disgusting, gruesome photo I've ever seen. During the rape of Nanking, there's a photo, and you can find it online. I probably will post this on the website of two Japanese soldiers with bayonets fixed to their rifles playing catch using their bayonets. And they were playing catch with a dead infant. It is the most disgusting and the most sadistic. It, it, it's easily the most evil, evil, down to its core thing that I have ever seen in all my studies of history and through all the photographs that I've seen that I wish I could never see again. This is the one that sticks out the most that I wish I could unsee. And it is the most brutal example of the evil capacity of human beings. And that is the precursor for this war in Asia that is about to unfold. But back to the story. On December 12th in 1937, as the attack was raging in Nanking, an American naval vessel, the USS Panay, it was anchored along the river outside the city, was hit by Japanese bombers. This was a shallow draft gunboat meant to patrol the Yangtze River to protect American interests. Regardless, it flew the American flag and had American flags clearly painted on its decks that should have been seen from a plane above. This should have been a precursor for the Americans in a warning. The Japanese claimed they didn't see the flags. Over incidents like this, wars can begin. The U.S. chose to accept the Japanese explanations that it was all just a mistake. We had full diplomatic relations with Japan, and it was an important trading partner. The Chinese government was weak and did not even govern vast areas of China, and aiding it would be futile. We had no means to either aid the Chinese or attack Japan, and that is something that I think most people don't realize, is we had no army to speak of, not much of a navy or planes, and all this was happening 10,000 miles away from the United States shores. It wasn't until something happened to us that we could really make a fuss about it. Well, if it was direct incitement that the American people were looking for, Pearl Harbor was just around the corner. On November 26th, a Japanese fleet, one headed south and one was headed elsewhere, so there were two fleets, my apologies, it was spotted off the Philippines and was so reported. It was apparently heading towards Singapore. Nobody in Washington or Hawaii even knew about the other one, at least not for certain, though there was speculation that a second fleet was mysteriously missing. We know, of course, the second fleet was headed to Pearl Harbor. It could be called back if somehow the powers in Tokyo decided to call it back. It had to keep strict radio silence, but it could receive radio signals. A weather report from Tokyo saying east wind rain, those words in precisely that order, meant that the decision had been made for war and the attack should proceed precisely as planned. And it was on November 27th that Admiral Kimmel and General Short, based in Pearl Harbor, received a war warning from Washington, saying that diplomacy had broken down and an attack was expected. This was over our negotiations with Japanese oil, and we were really their lifeline for oil. It did not, and it could not, pinpoint precisely where an attack might come. It specifically suggested the Philippines, the Crop Peninsula, or Borneo as the most likely targets. In Hawaii, this came amid all kinds of contradictory notices, dispatches, and reports, most of them based on guesswork as though trying to fit the pieces of a puzzle together. It was like a hurricane warning that didn't quite materialize, and then when the real one comes, nobody takes it seriously. What would you have done if you had been Kimmel or Short and you've received this war warning, but there's been so much other speculation? Nobody seems to think Hawaii is the most likely target, but only a possible target. And it's this revisionist history that comes into play where people so often try to, they try to say that it it should have been evident, but they have no basis for that. They were not there. All we know today is that no one expected this. And what was a, a precursor, a warning was seen as just a minor detail that really didn't matter in the long run because it seems so apparent. It just was not an attack. Sure enough, hindsight is always 20, 20. 
And on that day, December 7th of 1941, it was a Sunday. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. Americans posted to a gorgeous spot like Hawaii had gone out Saturday night. Many were hung over that Sunday morning. The attack was a complete surprise. Massive damage was done to the United States Pacific Fleet. The battleships, the dreadnought classes of Arizona, Oklahoma, and Nevada, Tennessee, and Maryland, and the California were all sunk. 2,235 Americans died. Many more were wounded. Many of them were wounded for life. It was the darkest single day in American history. President Roosevelt addressed the Congress the next morning. War was declared by the United States on Japan on December 8th of 1941. And now this point specifically marked this a truly global war. The war we now call World War II. And what happened from this point on was a mixture of events that I'm going to give a brief overview for. What happened was Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and then they expanded into the Philippines as well, where the British, the United States, and a few others had colonial interests. They took those over and they took all those people hostages. The Bataan Death March is where this comes from, where they marched, um, I believe it was about 60,000 prisoners. I'm sorry, it was about 76,000 prisoners. They marched them 50 miles because they needed to move them. They didn't feed them. It was hot. They had already been tortured for a very long time. And most of the men would die by asphyxiation because their tongue would swell from dehydration. They were bayoneted along the way. Anyone who stopped to help them along the way was bayoneted as well. And then they were forced to dig graves for those people. It was a brutal, brutal way to kill prisoners. And it kind of set the scene for the way that the Japanese were going to be treating the Pacific theater of war and their prisoners. And it kind of sets the tone for the way that the Americans had a, a just brutal hatred for the Japanese and what they had done and who could blame them. If these were your, your citizens, if these were your friends and family dying like this over there. And this was, this was one of the good stories. This wasn't even one of the gruesome ones. How could you blame anyone in that time period living in a different world for what they they heard and how the the stories they bred hatred? It's just it's a natural human reaction and it happens in every war. But this one was so much different. And what happened from this point on was the Marines, the United States Marines going island to island fighting the Japanese and they were fighting a foe that was determined at all costs, to defend their land all the way up to their homeland. Now, remember that they weren't on their their Japanese empire, the Japanese soil. They were on land that they had taken over, and it had become the Japanese empire. So the farther in they got, the more brutal the conflict began. And one of the worst feelings for Americans was the pre-landing bombardment that they would have to sit through before they went on. And it was almost like it was almost a tease because these bombardments were so awesome and they were so large that I believe I've, I've seen pretty much the same account from most of the Marines when they see their first one of who could live through that. And in this book, The Grunts, it tells a great story about the bombardment of Guam, which was pretty much the same thing as the rest of them. And I'll start it with the bombardment was an overwhelming cacophony of sound and violence. The men could feel the concussion in their chests. Their ears were assaulted by so much noise that they had trouble hearing the engines of their landing craft. Battleships spewed 16-inch shells at the shadowy hills beyond the beach. Cruisers added hundreds of 8-inch shells. The explosions sent fire and smoke hundreds of feet into the air, one Marine officer later wrote. Small fires burned along the entire length of the beach. Destroyers were firing shells from close range. They roved back and forth, one firing a series of volleys, followed by another firing into the same area. Each battleship, cruiser, and destroyer bristled with multiple anti-aircraft gun tubs. The crews lowered their guns to shoot in a flat trajectory and unloaded a dizzying array of small caliber shells into pre-selected targets. Tracer rounds from these guns formed nearly solid orange and red lines that stabbed into the beach with seemingly geometric precision. As the sun began to rise, specially modified landing craft infantry, LCI ships, hurried towards the shore and erupted in volleys of inaccurate but devastating rockets at Japanese pillboxes, command posts, and machine gun nests. 
In total, on this day alone, they fired nearly 1,400 rounds of 14 and 16 inch shells, 1,332 rounds of 8 inch shells, 2,430 rounds of 6 inch shells, 13,130 rounds of 5 inch shells, along with 9,000 rockets. And the sun had just risen by 6.30 in the morning. And amongst all that chaos and all that destruction, the most destroying and the most destructive thing of all was what the Marines faced when they got to the beach and when they realized those bombardments did almost nothing in the face of the Japanese because they were so organized in their defense with tunnels and pre-dug defensive fortifications, knowing that this was the only way we could do this, they were almost all there. They were actually so ineffective that experienced Marines knew better than to get excited about what they were witnessing. But the new Marines, they had no idea. Private First Class William Welch wrote, It made you wonder if anything could live through this pounding. Corporal Mari Williams, a recon scout with the 21st Marines, says... The bombardment was so intense that it seemed that the island itself would sink into the depths of the waters from the terrific pounding it was taking. I was convinced that not many Japs could survive that fire. It was Admiral Connolly, who was in the boats those days, that really voiced what everyone who had either been through it or was smart enough to already know. The bombardment cannot attain physical land objectives. There always must be fighting by the troops on the shore to secure the positions, he wrote. So even with the most effective pre-landing bombardment, even with all that firepower, it's still wholly ineffective in comparison with the boots on the ground who actually have to secure each position and secure the victory. And the fear that these men had when they were approaching the shore is something we've always wondered. It's been written, the raw fear stimulated adrenal glands, enhancing the senses. One soldier writes, your senses are different when you're about to invade, one Marine explained. The sun is never brighter, the sky never bluer, the grass, the jungle is never greener, and the blood is never redder. All your senses are just tingling. It's this pre-landing feeling in each soldier's stomach and head that we have been searching for since those days to find an accurate representation of what it was really like. And everyone in that scenario can only offer up their personal experience. It's often been noted that the beginning to the movie Saving Private Ryan is as close as you will ever get to a movie setting of what it was like by many, many of the vets who were there. And I have to tend to agree with everything that I've read. That is the most fascinating and the most realistic, horrific recount of what it would actually be like to be landing on those beaches and these marines were doing it over and over and over some of them made it from guam all the way to the very last landing imagine seeing that over and over and all that carnage displayed in front of you only to get back on the boat and to do it all over again and if all that wasn't enough you actually had to do the fighting against the japanese and they were notorious for their their terror tactics They would often surprise Marines in their foxholes in the middle of the night. And a good way to describe these bonsai charges with the way these these Japanese were sneaking up on these soldiers was on the night of July 25th, 1944 on Guam, a night commonly known as Fright Night. So on that night, there were periodic thunder showers uh, Filling the foxholes of the Marines with water, the Japanese exchanged goodbyes with one another and said their final prayers in preparation for that sacred assault. The mood was sadness laced with grim determination. The word gyokusai, meaning death with honor, could be heard passing from the lips of many of these men. One wrote, some took out photographs of their parents, wife, or children and bid farewell to them. Lieutenant Colonel Takeda wrote, Some prayed to God or Buddha, some composed a death poem, and some exchanged cups of water at final parting with intimate comrades. All pledged themselves to meet again at the Yasukuni Shrine. I apologize for my lack of pronunciation ruining from this story. The men believed that their spirits would live on forever at this great national shrine. Most fortified themselves with generous quantities of sake, and a few might have even doled their fears with narcotics. Uh, 
which was a commonplace thing in this time for foot soldiers in a suicide charge. But forward they went into the night in groups that were small and large, noisy, and quiet. And so picks up our story of Frank Goodwin, an 18-year-old kid, and I mean kid, from Malden, Massachusetts, who was sitting in a shallow foxhole atop a small hill peering into the darkness. Around him were the other men of the 1st Company of the 21st Marines, who were all doing the same thing. At his elbow, his buddy was sleeping, since it was Goodwin's turn to keep watch. He was huddled behind the protection of several coral rocks that he and his buddy had stacked for protection around their hole. In front of the position, Marines had placed empty ration cans on sticks in hopes that anyone sneaking up on their holes would bump into these cans, thus making noise. It was a very common uh, first line of defense against these Japanese sneak attacks because they were so talented at it. Overhead, a flare bathed the area in half-light. Goodwin looked down the hill and caught sight of what looked like four tree stumps a couple hundred feet away. He did not remember them being there in the daytime, but he knew the mine could play tricks at night. He woke his buddy and told him to take a look, but he saw nothing, and he wrote, I stared out in that direction for a long time, and as nothing seemed moved, I guess he was right. Besides, if they were that close, they surely would have run into the cans. Exhausted from several days of existence on the front line, Goodwin dozed off with a pistol in his lap. And just a few thousand yards to Goodwin's left was Private First Class Ed Adamski, who was in a machine gun nest that was a forward outpost for F Company in the 9th Marines. And Adamski had a dog. He was part of the dog company of the Marines who were exceptionally talented at notifying their owners, whom they were unbelievably loyal to, that the Japanese were soon to be there with a sneak attack at night. And this is where there are two different ways the attack could go. There's either the total surprise just by a few Japanese soldiers on some unsuspecting Marines, which was normal, uh, at night, they would just sneak up in small groups, um, knowing that they were going to die. Maybe 10 of them would spread out and jump into a foxhole and kill as many people as they could. Or in this case, it was a bonsai attack in which, in which case it was every Japanese soldier on the Island. Oftentimes they would even come out in crutches wounded or not would be on a death charge. Just one final charge. Hence the name bonsai. Uh, at the front lines of the United States Marines, and they were never effective, and the idea was to overwhelm them, but they all knew they were running to their graves. And at this point, they are making a lot of noise, and I apologize for the language. I am quoting um, a Marine here when he talks about the things that they would yell at these Marines as they were coming. So I'll pick up with the story of Private Bill Karpowicz, Carp Sorry, I cannot pronounce some of these names. And he says he can hear them yelling, making noises like beating metal drums, whistleblowing, etc. Another Marine heard the enemy laughing like shrill hyenas, clinging sabers against bayonets, shouting, The Emperor draws much blood tonight. Other Americans heard the sounds of bottles shattering amid slurred bellows, shrieks, and screams. The Japanese soldiers hollered many chilling phrases such as, Wake up, American, and die! Marine, you die tonight. One even cried, Fuck Babe Ruth. Sometimes they parroted the Americans hurling grenades and yelling, Fire in the hole, or Corman. This was a classic example of posturing. And in the human psyche, they will often try to mimic a, a bigger psychological threat or fear in hopes of the enemy turning away. And what should be noted here, and what makes me proud of my, my country is that there was not one recorded instance of a Marine running away at the sound of an enemy scream. And that really says a lot because the amount of fear that paralyzed these Marines was unspeakable. And I think that that is such a interesting and often overlooked fact. Not a single Marine was said to run away at the sound of an enemy scream. That means a lot to me. And now back to our friend Frank Goodwin, who was asleep when all this had started. He was awoken in the middle of the night by a blood-curdling scream of a Japanese soldier who had jumped right into his hole. Startled and terrified, he rolled over onto his back and pointed his pistol, firing at the same time, hitting the Jap in the face, and he fell right on top of me, he says. All at once, another enemy soldier was in the hole attacking Goodwin's buddy, a large man named Jernberg. The big Marine grabbed the smaller Japanese soldier and, quote, picked him up right by the crotch and threw him out of the hole and then went after him. 
Somehow or other, he found a rock in the middle of all this and smashed his head in. All along our lines, the screaming Japs were making their assault. We fought. With anything we could get our hands on, entrenching tools, pistols, rifles, fists, and rifle butts as they were right in the holes with us. Some of the Japanese had explosive demolition kits strapped to their chests. They were trying to jump into the American foxholes and detonate the explosives. There were pieces of flesh flying all over the area, Goodwin describes, as the Japanese soldiers de- detonated their kits. There were literal pieces of flesh flying through the air. It's hard for us today to imagine what that was like. And back to Ed Ad- Adamski, the dog handler, his dog Big Boy was alerting him to every Japanese that was on his way. Eventually, a grenade was dropped into the foxhole that spent that sent pieces of shrapnel into Fetzer's legs, knocking him into the hole. His dog, Skipper, had massive shrapnel wounds. As the fighting raged around them, Fetzer tried to administer first aid to his beloved dog, but the young Marine had his head pressed against Skipper's chest and listened at his companion's heart while it stopped beating. This is a story I include to show the opposite side of this. Rage engulfed Private First Class Fetzer. I went crazy. I stood up there like a wild man shooting. Around my foxhole, there must have been eight or ten Japs laying there. They shouldn't have killed my dog. That was just like a piece of me. And that's what I include that at Adamski saw, because it shows this this unique perspective of, while well, all this destruction and chaos was going around him, these soldiers, these Marines, on, on all fronts, were suffering such incredible loss and heartache, while also experiencing this chaotic adrenaline and fear and just awe around them and it's hard to imagine yourself in a situation like that it, it, certainly I think I would be going insane and this is this is just one small example of that that while they were experiencing anger and rage beyond anyone's imagination they were also experiencing the most heartache and the biggest portion of pain all at once that you could possibly imagine. And it's no wonder that these soldiers, most of them came back scarred forever. This ability to defend island after island was the Japanese most strong tactic. And it came to its high watermark on the island of Pele Lu in September of 1944. The greatest strength of the Japanese soldier in World War II was his willingness to fight to the death in the most tenacious fashion, even when cut off, surrounded and leaderless. And this this willingness stems from the Bushido Warrior Code, which inextricably linked a soldier's family honor, duty, and patriotism and his loyal to the emperor with his willingness to sacrifice himself, which in general meant that the Japanese soldiers were better on defense than offense. And like I mentioned before, it was never more apparent than on the island of Pele Lu in September of 44. The general, taking his cue from... General Inoue was the army's commander, and Palos understood that inland defense was the best way to maximize his strength. He says, I issued strict orders that the bonsai attack was not to be employed because it wasted manpower, which could be put to more effective use. I ordered that the men fight a delaying action from prepared positions, causing as many enemy casualties as possible. Basically, he understood that Japan no longer possessed the naval and air strength by this point to repulse American invasions at the waterline. Bonsai attacks were just wasteful, and it contributed to more vanity than victory. The best hope for victory was to just bleed the Americans dry until they had no more will to fight. So at Pele Lu, he ordered his 10,500 defenders to just dig extensive fortifications within caves that could be impervious to the bombing. And to make matters worse, the island of Pele Lu had natural fortifications within those caves, which made the Japanese all the more merry to do that job in the first place. And what they did with the beach is that they had, they had pre-sighted the entire landing area from the beaches all the way to a prominent coral reef a few hundred yards offshore. So the Marines were walking into a machine gun trap. Uh, one Marine writes um, during the landing that Nambu machine guns chattered mercilessly, seemingly inundating the beach with bullets, kicking up sand and water, tearing into men. The bullets shattered bones, blew heads off, lacerated kidneys, and tore muscles into mush. This machine gun tactic was known as grazing fire, and what its purpose was was to hit anything within two feet of the ground, especially a prone Marine. One Marine writes, From then on, it was just a series of close shaves and acts of God. No one would make it to shore easily, and most wouldn't. 
And if the machine gun fire wasn't wasn't bad enough, Corporal Alexander Costella, he tells the story about the snipers that were on the beach. Our men were being picked off like flies. I ran up the beach dodging sniper fire and mortar fire, all the time firing my weapon into the trees hoping to hit some snipers. He dived face down into a shallow hole. Gritty grains of sand irritated his eyes and lips. One sniper got his sights on me. He did not miss by much. The bullet hit the sand in front of my face with such impact that it drew blood from my face. And when he was in this foxhole, a friend of his named Joe Reed jumped in next to him. Reed was a popular guy, the sort of person who knew how to make everyone else laugh. Costella turned to warn Reed about the snipers. He says, and I quote, Before I could finish my words, he was hit in the middle of the forehead. The blood seeped out of a small hole. He had a blank stare. I knew he was gone. Casella said he felt terrible, but he had no time to dwell on his friend's death. He just sprayed trees with fire from his Thompson submachine gun, got up and ran to another position after another position. The only way to stop this this machine gun blanketing was to make your way, little by little, close enough, and they had to had to lean in and shoot them point blank with no mercy or reflection. In Grunt's, the quote is, It was the very essence of the infantryman's decidedly personal war. One Marine wrote of the Peleliu beach landings, who was new to combat, filled with anger, revulsion, and abject frustration. He says, I quote, I had tasted the bitterest essence of war, the sight of helpless comrades being slaughtered, and it filled me with disgust. And people often overlook the job that the medics had, all while this was all going on. One medic writes, his name Leslie Harold. He was 19 in the C Company of Marines who was moving up the beach when he saw a man from his unit get shot in the mouth. He writes, The guy's tongue was cut. He was choking to death on his own tongue and blood flowing from down his throat. I got a hold of the guy's tongue and his bottom lip and I clipped him together with a, he- with a hemostat. Harold then jammed several compress badges into the Marine's mouth to further staunch the bleeding. I dug out teeth and bits of gum. I did treat the shock by putting in a liter of blood plasma. He wrote down what he had done on a tag and pinned it to the wounded man, and doctors aboard a hospital ship offshore would know what his status was. Then he flagged down an Amtrak to evacuate him, and no sooner had he finished with the case than a bullet slammed into another Marine, quote, right between the eyes. The bullet went in, hit something, turned, and went out right in front of his ear. It was like hearing a cantaloupe dropped on the sidewalk. Harold attended to him, tagged him, and sent him to an Amtrak, all the while under withering fire. To say that this was a bloody, gruesome war would be an understatement. And what these Marines saw in Japan was was more, more violence and more carnage than the human mind, I think, is ever intended to see. And it, it resulted in this desensitization that Colonel Eugene Sledge writes in his memoirs many, many years later, but something that I've always, always had stick out with me as a story and well, it's not just really one story, it's many stories, but if you've read his book, With the Old Breed, you know the stories I'm talking about because they're some of the most famous. And he begins with writing about how they treated the dead the dead enemies that, that had fallen on the battlefield. And he says, The men gloated over, compared, and often swapped their prizes. It was a brutal, ghastly ritual, the likes of which have occurred since ancient times on battlefields, where the antagonists have possessed a profound mutual hatred. It was uncivilized, as is all war, and was carried out with that particular savagery that characterized the struggle between the Marines and the Japanese. It wasn't simply souvenir hunting or looting the enemy dead. It was more like Indian warriors taking scalps. While I was removing a bayonet and scabbard for dead Japanese soldiers, I noticed a Marine, dragging what I assumed to be a corpse, but the Japanese wasn't dead. He had been wounded severely in the back and couldn't move his arms. The Japanese's mouth glowed with huge gold crown teeth and his capture, captor wanted them. He put the point of his K-bar knife on the base of his tooth and hit the handle with the palm of his hand. Because the Japanese was kicking his feet and thrashing about, the knife point glanced off the tooth and sank deeply into the victim's mouth. The Marine cursed him and with a slash cut his cheeks open ear to ear. He put his foot on the sufferer's lower jaw and tried again. Blood poured out of the soldier's mouth. I then shouted, Put the man out of his misery. All I got for an answer was a cussing out. Another Marine ran up, put a bullet in the enemy soldier's brain, and ended his agony. The scavenger grumbled and continued extracting his prizes undisturbed. If that is not a harrowing first-hand account of what it was like 
as far as desensitization of violence and gruesome treatment of another human being, then I don't know what is. He goes on to talk about another story where he details what it was like to knowingly get his first kill and his happened to be up close and personal. He writes, Even before the dust had settled, I saw a Japanese soldier appear at the blasted opening. He was grim determination personified as he drew back his arm to throw a grenade at us. My carbine was already up. When he appeared, I lined up my sights on his chest and began squeezing off shots. As the first bullet hit him, his face contorted in agony. His knees buckled. The grenade slipped from his grasp. All the men near me began firing. The soldier collapsed in the fusillade and the grenade went off at his feet. He then writes, I had just killed a man at close range. That I had seen clearly the pain on his face when my bullets hit him came as a jolt. It suddenly made the war a very personal affair. The expression on that man's face filled me with shame and disgust for the war and all the misery that it was causing. And what I think is special about Sledge's account of of his experience in World War II is that he captures this ability to retell the war in a way that makes the reader aware of how much death they were constantly surrounded by. Most people always talk about stories like I just told of firsthand accounts of their first kill or killing another soldier, but Sledge writes about, and he writes in detail about all the death that was just always around them. Here he writes, There were certain areas we moved into and out of several times as the campaign dragged along its weary, bloody course. In many such areas, I became quite familiar with the sight of some particular enemy corpse, as if it were a landmark. It was gruesome to see the stages of decay proceed from just killed, to bloated, to maggot-infested rotting, to partially exposed bones, like some biological clock marking the inexorable passage of time. On each occasion my company passed such a landmark, we were fewer in number. How do you handle going from, in, in Sledge's case, the son of a doctor in Alabama in a nice house to all of to the sudden hell on earth? It's a, it's a transition that few people can actually understand. And he has one story that's particularly gruesome about the way that they treated these dead bodies around them. They were so used to them, they didn't even, they didn't even notice that they were there. He writes about a time on Pele Lu where they had a little bit of downtime before their next advancement. And he says, At first glance, the dead Japanese machine gunner appeared, to, appeared about ready to fire his deadly weapon. He still sat bolt upright in the proper firing position, even in death, his eyes stared widely along the gun sights. The crown of the gunner's skull had been blasted off. As a, as a company K rifleman and I talked, I noticed a fellow mortarman sitting next to me. He held a handful of coral pebbles in his left hand. With his right hand, he idly tossed them into the open skull of a dead Japanese machine gunner. Each time, his pitch was true. I heard a little splash of rainwater in the ghastly receptacle. My buddy tossed the coral chunks as casually as a boy casting pebbles into a puddle on some muddy road back home. There was nothing malicious in his action. The war had so brutalized us that it was beyond belief. He later goes on to write about how the war was for those who were not on the front lines and how different it was, the, he calls it, on the periphery of action. But what it is important to remember is, just like in the thesis of that book Grunts I talked about earlier is that the foot soldiers, the ones who were who were doing the action, the ones who were getting those objectives, this was their war. This was this was something unexplainable that they were going through for the name of whatever cause they were fighting for. In Sledge writes, to the non combatants and those on the periphery of action, the war meant only boredom or occasional excitement. But to those who entered the meat grinder itself, the war was a netherworld of horror from which escape seemed less and less likely as casualties mounted and the fighting dragged on and on. Time had no meaning. Life had no meaning. The fierce struggle for survival in the abyss of Pele Lu eroded the veneer of civilization and made savages of us all. We existed in an environment totally incomprehensible to men behind the lines, service troops and civilians. I mean, based on that quote, I might as well just stop what I'm doing right now because no one can truly understand what it was like for those men on Pelelu 
or in the Pacific Theater or in France on the European side, no one can actually know what that was like. No matter how many books you read or stories you hear, it cannot be accurately portrayed unless you were there in the middle of that chaos, carnage, and death surrounding you the entire time. But we can do our best to try and understand what that was like for all of those men there. Because the more you learn about it, the more you realize that this is something that humanity should never have to go through again. But unfortunately, if history is any judge of the future, it seems like we will have this happen again at some point. And this was just one island among so many that the Marines jumped onto and went through chaos after chaos after death after death in order to fight the Japanese in the name of American freedom, all the while getting closer to the mainland of Japan where casual t- casualties were expected to reach one million American soldiers just in the initial invasion. But that's getting ahead of ourselves in this story. We have to back up a little bit to the summer of 1944 in London, where they had just gone through an intense amount of bombing known as the Battle of Britain. This was Hitler's plan to take over Great Britain and then move towards the United States. But none of them knew at the time that he actually had ambitions for the U.S. Nonetheless, Britain had been subject to horrific bombings and air raids for months on end before finally Hitler made the vast mistake of invading the Soviet Union, just like Napoleon did in the winter, this time in 1941. What this did was, aside from freezing to death half of his troops, it split his army in multiple directions. And the Americans and the Allies took advantage of this split and decided that after this and after the mounting losses that he had he had sustained, and by 1944 his, his losses were 3.5 million, which is noted that the Russian forces had quadruple that amount lost in that attack in Operation Barbarossa, which is the code name Hitler gave for that winter invasion in Russia. Which I also skipped ahead without saying, obviously, it should be noted that the Nazis um, went against the agreements of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact earlier and decided to attack Russia. It was Hitler's biggest mistake, and obviously he lost quite a, quite a bit, quite a million of people, 3.5 million to be exact. So, with these losses mounting, it became apparent that the time was coming if we were going to get involved in the war, this was going to be close to when it was going to happen. And sure enough, just three years later, they put Dwight D. Eisenhower, who we would later know as Ike, as our president, in charge of the... He was the Supreme General of the Allied Command. He was in charge of formulating the plan to invade France and start the liberation of Europe from the Nazi hold. And it should be noted that Eisenhower was probably the only reason that this entire invasion didn't go south. He got all of his generals and commanders and and many, many just common privates together um, to discuss the plan that Churchill says, the only plan was to persevere, uh, as he put it himself, and perseverance had brought them to the brink, a chance to close with the enemy and destroy him in his European citadel, four years after Germany overran France and the Low Countries. They had long been advocating confronting the main German armies as soon as possible, and this pugnacic, pugnacity decried as ironmongering by British strategists whose preference for reducing the enemy gradually by attacking the Axis had led to 18 months of Mediterranean fighting, which I was speaking about earlier as the Battle of Britain. This arena would shift north, and the British and Americans would monger iron together. So Eisenhower got all his people together, and he said... I consider it to be the duty of anyone who sees a flaw in the plan not to hesitate to say so. He was a smart, smart man. He knew that if he was going to make the plan, he had to present it to his soldiers who were actually going to be carrying it out in order for them to point out the flaws. And it is an unspeakable strength of a leader 
who can take a plan of his and subject it to the lowest of his command for overall criticism. And that is part of why the Americans won the war, because the Nazis were responsible to answer strictly to Hitler. They could not, they couldn't come up with plans on the fly. They couldn't ad lib, so to speak, on the battlefield. And that has always been one of the biggest strengths of American wartime strategies that there's a famous quote where, and it sounds awful lot like uh, General Patton saying it, but I can't attribute it to anyone right now, where one one kind of gritty colonel is saying to another, if we don't know what we're doing on the battlefield, then the enemy sure as hell doesn't know what we're doing. And that's kind of the whole thing that got the Nazis is they had, I mean, they had an entire tank regiment that didn't even respond to the D-Day landings. But I'm getting ahead of myself in the story, and I don't want to spoil part of the next episode. So General Eisenhower was planning out Operation Overlord, what we know as D-Day. And it really came down to as simple as this. If Overlord succeeded, the Normandy assault would dwindle to a mere episode in the larger saga of Europe's liberation. If Overlord failed, the entire Allied enterprise faced abject collapse. And it had to begin with, quote, an ugly piece of water called the Channel, as the official U.S. Army history would describe it. It was a invasion that was only 19 miles away from its, from its starting point from country to country. And it was an invasion that had more planning and foresight than any, any operation in the military history of the United States. It was so complicated and so difficult a question to answer of how to get into France to fight the Nazis that they even considered tunneling under the channel. A detailed study deemed the project feasible, requiring a year and 15,000 men to excavate and 55,000 tons of spoil. Wiser heads questioned the strategic and functional complexities, such as the inconvenience of the entire German 7th Army waiting for the first tunneler to emerge, and the project was canned. And it was, it was so many different ideas, no one knew what to do. And Montgomery, General Montgomery, the the British high command, said, We shall have to send the soldiers into this party seeing red. Nothing must stop them. If we send them into battle this way, then we shall succeed. And he was right, as much as I truly despise him, and I'll tell you all about why, but he was right. They had to see red. They had to be dropped off and just let loose. But all of that hinges on the ability of the person coming up with the plan to do it correctly. And no one was more keenly aware to the fact that the three times prior to this, Germans had nearly driven Allied landings back into the sea. It was all in Italy, at Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio. And we were so lucky that we had Ike, General Eisenhower, as the one planning. And, I mean, the planners under him even coined the operation as an acronym called PINWE, P-I-N-W-E, stood for Problems of the Invasion of Northwest Europe, because for every problem that was solved, the way they solved it gave a rise to another problem. Uh, They went as far as a fog dispeller uh, that blew flames in the air to burn off mist from British airships to keep it secret, and it cost 60,000 gallons of gasoline an hour. So how do you how do you do that? And then there were military replacements for civilian workers hired to assemble military gliders, which were critical to the invasion plan. The civilians had so botched the job that 51 of the first 62 gliders were deemed unflyable. Another hundred improperly lashed down had been badly damaged by high winds. I mean, every pin we item resolved, another arose. Oxford uh, officers now studied Norman Town construction to determine. What parts would burn best? A knowledge that would be useful in dispensing scarce firefighting equipment. Um, they they compiled a list of 18 leading German military personalities now in France and particularly ripe for, for assassination. Uh, Rommel was among them. And it was it was stuff like this that they had to consider every tiny detail. And it just so happened to be the largest invasion in military history of the entire world. But Eisenhower was the one man who was able to get it done, and he recently had written to a friend in Washington, quote, Everyone gets more and more on edge. A sense of humor and a great faith or else a complete lack of imagination are essential to the project. 
he could really only ram his feet deeper into the stirrups that he was already in. And amidst all this chaos of planning and all of this confusion, Eisenhower was able to think about the individual soldier. And he even said, quote, I don't have to think. He wrote to his wife, how many youngsters are gone forever? And he was able to keep, as he called it, what a man must develop, and quote, a man must develop a veneer of callousness. The British Empire had now exceeded half a million casualties, 16 divisions to be committed under General Montgomery, including the Canadians and Poles, amounted to Churchill's last troops reserves. The British casualty forecast, calculated under a formula known as something called Evitt's Rates, projected three levels of combat until this point. They were quiet, normal, and intense. And quote, but the anticipated carnage in Normandy had led planners to add a new level, double intense. According to a British study, enemy fire sweeping a 200 by 400 yard swatch of beach for two minutes would inflict casualties above 40% on an assault battalion, a bloodletting comparable to the Somme in 1916. The American casual, casualty predictions were used using a calculation called Love's Tables, which would likely which pardon me which would likely reach 12% of the assault force on D-Day or higher if gas warfare erupted. And keep in mind, they had no idea what they were going to be facing. The first infantry division, the point of the spear on Omaha Beach, estimated that under quote unquote maximum conditions, casualties would reach 25%, of whom almost a third would be killed, captured, or missing. The admiral commanding the bombardment forces on Utah told his captains that, quote, we might expect to lose one-third to one-half of our ships. Projected U.S. combat drownings in June, exclusive of paratroopers, have been calculated at grimly precise 16,726. To track the dead, wounded, and missing, the casualties section under their general intelligence agency it would grow to 300 strong, so complex were the calculations that an early incarnation of the computer using punch cards would be put to the task. I mean, these, these were some serious things they were trying to figure out, and all the while, recent exercises and rehearsals, just they didn't look good at all. Eisenhower had no optimism whatsoever since January. In coves and Firth around Britain, troops were decanted into the shallows, quote, hopping around trying to keep our more vulnerable parts out of the water, one captain explained. Quote, Sometimes they stood on the beach and biffed imaginary defenders into the hills. Sometimes they biffed imaginary invaders from the hills into the sea. Sometimes they merely collided with imaginary rivals for the use of the main road and biffed them out of the way. And this was an exact quote of what Eisenhower was getting reported to. How can you have any faith that this isn't going to be ending in a complete and utter disaster? And that's the thing about this entire Normandy invasion. No one knew what it was going to turn out like. No one knew what they were facing, and no one really knew what success they were going to have. It's, it's not uncommon knowledge that Eisenhower had two letters on that day, one for a successful invasion and one for a failure, in which he takes full responsibility, and for the success he gives full responsibility to the men on the beaches. He was an incredible general, and we are truly lucky to have him. It would be an entirely different world had we not had his discernment and leadership available. And it wasn't until one story came out about the imaginary quote-unquote biffing turning all too real on April 28th of 1944 through, quote, a series of mistakes and misunderstandings and investigators later concluded Troop Convoy T-4 was left virtually unprotected as it steamed towards Slapton Sands on the south coast of Devon, chosen for its resemblance to Normandy. At 2 a.m., nine German E-boats eluded a British escort 12 miles offshore and torpedoed three U.S. Navy LSTs with such violence that soldiers on three LSTs nearby thought that they had been hit. Fire, quote, spread instantly from stem to stern, a witness reported. Two ships sank, one in seven minutes disproving latrine scuttlebutt that torpedoes would pass beneath a shallow draft LST. And it often goes unnoticed that there were casualties before this invasion even began. How successful do you think an invasion would be if you were planning it and that happened? You can't blame anyone for thinking that this was going to be a total disaster. The final death toll for that slapped in sands incident would reach 700 in 
and Eisenhower grieved for those men, no less for the loss of those vehicles, because they now stood with a reserve of zero. He wrote to George C. Marshall, not a restful thought about the loss of those LSTs. He often quoted Napoleon's definition of a military genius as, quote, the man who can do the average thing when all those around him are going crazy. And what a better time for this quote than now, because everyone around him seemed to be going crazy. He was the supreme commander. That was his actual title. He was widely respected by all those who were under him. General Montgomery wrote, he has a generous and lovable character, uh, and I would trust him to the last gasp. Other comrades considered him, quote, clubbable, articulate, and profoundly fair. His senior naval subordinate, Admiral Sir Bertram H. Ramsey, asserted simply, he is a very great man. And FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president at the time, had chosen him to command this Operation Overlord as, quote, the best politician among the military men. He is a natural leader who can convince other men to follow him. And that is the essence of what we needed. We needed a natural leader who could convince other men to follow him, or else this whole thing was kaput. And as we often see in the great leaders of our time, he had, uh, he had doubts about himself, but he also sensed the doubts of him that were in British newspapers. In his own diary, he lamented the depiction of him in British newspaper as an administrator rather than a battlefield commander, and he writes, quote, They dislike to believe that I had anything particularly to do with campaigns. They don't use the words initiative and boldness in talking of me. It wearies me to be thought of as timid when I've had to do things that were so risky as to be almost crazy. Oh, hum. And among all of these doubts that he had about himself and his plan, he knew that the one thing that success rested on was A, privacy and secrecy of the plan, but B, the character of the American foot soldier that the plan hinged upon. And what better to describe these millions of men by the words of poet Randall Jarrell, who wrote, quote, You are something there are millions of. Just over 8 million had been inducted into the U.S. Army and Navy during the past two years, 11,000 each day. The average GI was 26 years old, born the year to end all wars was ended in 1919, the manpower demands in this global struggle meant that the force was growing younger. Henceforth, nearly half of all American troops arriving to fight in Europe in 1944 would be teenagers. One in three GIs had only a grade school education. One in four held a high school diploma. And slightly more than one in ten had attended college for at least a semester. War Department pamphlet 21-13 would assure them that they were, quote, the world's best paid soldiers. A private earned $50 a month, a staff sergeant $96, and any valiant GI awarded the Medal of Honor would receive an extra $2 each month. The typical soldier stood 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighed 144 pounds. Physical standards did have to be lowered, though, to accept defects that once would have been keeping many of these men out of the uniform. A man with 2400 vision could now be conscripted if his sight was correctable to at least 2040 in one eye. Toward that end, the armed forces would make 2.3 million pairs of eyeglasses for their troops. There was an old joke that the army no longer examined eyes, but instead just counted them. It seems it had come true. Although later on in the war, the army was so desperate for men that they began drafting, quote, moderate obsessive compulsives as well as stutterers. Men with malignant tumors, leprosy, or certifiable psychosis were still deemed non-acceptable, but by early 1944, 12,000 venereal disease patients, most of them syphilitic, were inducted each month and rendered fit for service with the new miracle drug called penicillin. But all these conditions, they only marked the physical. What about their soul? What about the ideals and their inner beliefs that, that intrigued Eisenhower and made them these soldiers that he loved? Few professed to be warriors or even natural soldiers. Most were, quote, Amateurs whose approach to soldiering was aggressively temporary, one officer said. Uh, an April survey in Britain polled enlisted men about what they would ask Eisenhower if given the chance. At least half wanted to know what even the Supreme Commander could not tell them. When can we go home? A paratrooper in the 101st Airborne Division, the famous Easy Company, said, quote, I will never get used to having some other person do my thinking for me. 
all of these months, and I am still a civilian at heart. And thus he would die a few months later in Holland. And what always gets me, and I, I'll, I'll try to end with this, because this is approaching two hours now, but the sheer monstrosity of the preparations for this invasion force, just before they even got way to Britain. Uh, here's an excerpt from a book called The Guns at Last Light by Rick Atkinson, probably the best book to read about the European theater that has ever been written. He says, quote, and so four by four by four, they boarded those troop trains on the docks to be hauled to 1,200 camps and 133 airfields across the British Isles. Quote, this country reminds me, reminds one constantly of Thomas Hardy, an overeducated lieutenant wrote his mother. But in truth, it was a land of the white swans and country folk who bicycled to ancient churches. Quote, in the old steady manner and unsmilingly, unsmilingly touched their caps, as the journalist Eric Severide reported. Prayers tacked to parish doors in 1940 still pleaded, quote, save our beloved land from invasion, O God. But no longer did the Home Guard expect to battle the Hun at Dover with decrepit rifles or with the pikes issued to those without firearms. Even some road signs, removed early in the war to confound enemy parachutists, had been put back after complaints that lost American truck drivers were using too much gasoline. There were 400,000 prefabricated huts. 279,000 tents had been erected to accommodate the Yankees coming into Britain, supplementing 112,000 borrowed British, quote-unquote, borrowed British buildings and 20 million square feet of storage space. The new GIs called this new world, quote, spam land. But the prevailing odor came from burning feces in the U.S. Army School of Hygiene coal-fired incinerators. Along with all the men, they brought 23 million tons of material carried across the Atlantic in cargo ships that arrived either days or months after the troops on their fast, uh, the name of the ship was the Queen's, there were truck drivers separated from trucks, drummers from their drums, chaplains from their chalices. Thousands of arri items arrived with indecipherable bills of lading or without shipping addresses other than glue, the code for Southern England, or bang, Northern Ireland, or ugly, which was an unknown code word. The Ministry of Transport allocated 120 berths for U.S. Army ships in May, but an extra 38 had arrived. Despite negotiations that reached the White House and Whitehall, Almost half the cargo from these orphan vessels eventually was dumped outside various ports. And with all that material and all those men pouring into England, even even the language was an issue to, to bear with. There were detailed glossaries that were translating English into English for, for American soldiers coming in. Chemist was a druggist. Geyser was a hot water heater. Tire, spelled T-Y-R-E, was what we considered a tire for a car. There were disparities in pay. I mean, all these things, they, they came along, but what, what all the, the British realized, well, and the Americans realized it too, but this is coming from the British standpoint, that both on the battlefield and in the rear, the transatlantic relationship would remain, in one British general's description, quote, a delicate hothouse growth that must be carefully tended lest it wither away. Nothing less than the Western civilization depended on it. As American soldiers by the boatload continued to swarm into their spam land camps, a British major spoke for most of his countrymen when he said, quote, They were the chaps that mattered. We couldn't possibly win the war without them. And that was the notion that no matter how many men wanted to or didn't want to admit it, they all knew that they were about to go off to war and they all needed each other. And it always blows me away, the Operation Overlord and how much it took up, the U.S. Army had accumulated 301,000 vehicles, 1,800 train locomotives, 20,000 rail cars, 2.6 million small arms, 2,700 artillery pieces, 300,000 telephone poles, and 7 million tons of gasoline, oil, and lubricants. They had calculated the daily combat consumption from fuel to bullets to chewing gum at 41.298 pounds per soldier. This was an invasion that required landing in the first couple hours. Let me see what the what the quote is. 7,000 kinds of combat necessities. They had to reach it in the first four hours. Everything from surgical scissors to bazooka rockets, followed by tens of thousands of tons in the days in the days to come. 
And what they did was they actually sat down in a, in a basement near the Selfridges department store and they prepared loading plans with the blueprints of deck and cargo space spread on huge tables with wooden blocks scaled to every Jeep howitzer and shipping container and pushed them around like chess pieces, chess pieces to make sure they fit. Soldiers in their camps laid out full-size deck replicas of the ground and practiced wheeling trucks and guns in and out. This was something that was not just going to fall together on accident. In two in 22 British ports, Steve Doors slung pallets and cargo nets into holds and onto decks, loading radios from Pennsylvania, grease from Texas, rifles from Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, they needed 60 million K rations just to feed the army for a month. They were packed into 500 ton bales. I mean, this was a massive, massive operation and just a logistical standpoint that it seems like a nightmare and they were able to do it for the very most part without a hitch. I mean, obviously a lot got screwed up, but they were successful. And that's something I think that gets so overlooked these days is just how minute they had to get. I mean, they had people pushing wooden blocks around like chess pieces to see if things fit. This isn't the planning that we are so used to today with all the uh, laser measuring and computers to help us do the small minute details that we don't want to or need to be sped up calculation wise. I mean, just take for example this armed guards from 10 cartography depots, they escorted 3,000 tons of maps for D Day alone. The first 210 million maps that would be distributed in Europe uh, were printed in five colors. Also, into their holds were 280,000 hydrographic charts for towns like. Cherbourg and St. Lo for where they were going to be going. I mean, these are, that's, that is so big. That is 3000 tons of just paper maps. Can you wrap your head around that? That's a lot of stuff. And they had to get it all there and they had to get it all planned out correctly. And among all those things that were being brought into England, among all those ports, it was the blood that gave away to all the soldiers that D-Day was near. What their plans were, were they wanted to stockpile 3,000 pints for Operation Overlord's initial phase. That's one pint for every 2.2 wounded soldiers, almost a fourfold increase in the ratio used in Italy. But whole blood only kept for two weeks at most. And as the last week of May arrived, there could be little doubt that D-Day was near. The blood, in large, clearly marked canisters, had landed. And in the last-ditch effort to keep this whole operation secret, deception was the greatest key. The greatest prevarication of the war, originally known as Appendix Y, until it was given the codename of Fortitude, it tried, quote, to induce the enemy to make faulty strategic dispositions of forces, as the combined chiefs requested. 1,500 Allied deceivers used phony radio traffic to suggest that a fictional army with eight divisions in Scotland would attack Norway in league with the Soviets, followed by a larger invasion of France in mid-July through the Pas de Calais, 150 miles northeast of the actual Overlord beaches. And they had deployed these things called Big Bobs. Uh, They had deployed more than 200 of them that were 8 tons apiece. They were decoy landing craft fashioned from canvas and oil drums, conspicuously deployed beginning May 20th around the Thames estuary. Dummy transmitters now broadcast the radio hubbub of a spectral 150,000-man U.S. First Army group, notionally poised to pounce on the wrong coast in the wrong month. The British genius for this was was incredible. They had more than a dozen German agents. All were discovered, all were arrested, and all were flipped by British intelligence officers. They had a network of British double agents with codenames like Garbo and Tricycle, Embellished the deception and some 500 deceitful radio reports were sent from London to enemy spy masters in Madrid and thence to Berlin, the fortitude deception had spawned a German hallucination. Enemy, enemy analysts now detected, quote, 79 Allied divisions staging in Britain, when in fact there were but 52. By late May, by late May Allied intelligence, including Ultra, the British ability to intercept and decipher most coded German radio traffic, had uncovered no evidence suggesting, quote, that the enemy has accurately assessed the area in which our main assault is to be made, end quote, which was a massive relief to Eisenhower, to say the least. And to top off that story, uh, most of you have probably heard it, but it's called the Ghost Army, where they actually had a fake uh, 
tank corps under the the charge of I think it was George C. Marshall or General Patton. I can't recall off the top of my head, but they actually had blown up inflatable tanks, men, airplanes, boats, landing craft, all staging in an area uh, near the Strait of Dover, which is where the Germans expected the attack to be because it was only 19 miles at its longest point from land to land. And they successfully tricked the Germans into thinking they had a massive staging going on there. It should all just go to show you how much thought and how much creativity was used in prepping out this D-Day invasion, this invasion of all invasions that has never even been attempted before and hasn't been since. It was it was truly hard to to imagine all of this planning and foresight. And as for how the soldiers felt about all this, I guess the words of Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Um, were probably spoken and could be said for all soldiers quote we're ready now as ready as we'll ever be and he wrote his wife quote the blackbird says to his brother if this be the last song ye shall sing sing well for you may not sing another and that is how each soldier felt going into this day of all days we're ready now as we'll ever be in the moments leading up to the invasion when the first paratroopers took off to be the pre, pre-invasion, the 82nd and 101st Airborne, who were the unfortunate divisions in the Little Bighorn incident many, many years earlier where they were slaughtered, the, the prospect of another Little Bighorn, particularly for the two American Airborne divisions ordered to France, they gnawed at Eisenhower in these final hours, and after watching them board, he went in and he wrote, just in case, and I quote, our landings in the Cherbourg Havre area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops, he wrote. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. And he dated that paper July 5th, just in case he needed to. He told one of his generals, it's really hard to look a soldier in the eye when you fear that you are sending him to his death, and it's hard to really imagine what kind of stresses and what kind of just unbelievable pressure this man was under the night before the invasion. And even amongst all that, what really is the most awe-inspiring of all the accounts of all of what happened is that of the individual soldier as he was headed out to go to war against an enemy that he did not know and to a place he did not understand. Ultimately, he had no idea what he was getting into. And their words on this final night before they were headed out to land on the beaches of Normandy are, are I think, the best to end the episode with as we pick up in the next episode that begins with the invasion. These are the melancholy words of the soldiers who were about to go and face a carnage that the world had never understood and would never see to this day again. One troop simply yelled, flap your wings, you big-assed bird, to the plane that was taking off and getting ready to carry him into chaos. One one soldier wrote, I hope to God I know what I'm doing. One soldier wrote, give me guts, as he prayed over and over, give me guts. And as they went out, short seas snapped tow ropes, flooded engine rooms, and sloshed through troop compartments. Some helmsmen, vessels blinkered a one-word message, seasick, seasick, seasick. One soldier writes, Stay light, he murmured. Stay on forever, and we'll never get to Normandy. The light faded and was gone. Down ten channels they plunged, two designated for each of the five forces steaming towards five beaches, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword, wakes braided and rebraided. Stay light, stay on forever, and we'll never get to Normandy. If you like this episode, I'd encourage you to check out the show notes and the works cited um, and all the transcriptions that I will put available on the website, themondayamerican.com. You can also follow more um, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Twitter. You can follow us at, at Monday American on Facebook. It's the Monday American. You can find us on YouTube and uh, pretty much on any any 
podcasting platform that's available. Um, thank you so much for listening to part one of what will likely be a three-part series. I don't want to put a put a final estimate on it, but I don't want to get too, too overly involved. This is a two-hour episode already, and I just cannot thank you enough for all the support that you have shown me and the downloads that have been um, growing literally exponentially per per week. Um, I am so very thankful for all of you that are listening and all of you that are sharing, and I hope that you have enjoyed this, and I hope that you are eagerly anticipating episode two or part two, episode 11 of the Monday American, which will cover World War II in part two form. Thank you again for listening, and I will see you next time.